Evan. Evan has come back to us after some years in the wilderness, and he is, that is, means he doesn't come to the UK enough, but now he is going to start, and I've got his presentation title up there, and I'm going to let him get on with it. Questions at the end. Okay. Thank you. Um, wilderness. I, I don't think of digital preservation as, as a wilderness, but I spent seven years at Portico, and one of the aspects of that was processing uh, 15 million journal articles from 70 publishers. And, uh, it, it was an interesting opportunity um, to see what was going on in our industry under the hood. And so what I'm talking about today is actually about under the hood, plumbing, and uh, how we actually make things happen architecturally. So, uh, down arrow. So, um, so this talk is about plumbing. <laughs> uh, it's about s solution architecture, about how we connect the dots and make things happen within our much more complicated world. I am going to do a brief case study of, of projects we've done recently at AIP Publishing, um, just because they're examples of, of how you, the questions that have to be addressed in solutions, not that they're particularly magic solutions. Uh, the answers always depend on the particulars of your requirements, your systems, your, you know, your mileage may vary, as it were. So. Um, this presentation um, follows on from a talk that I gave at the first JATSCon in 2010, which is up on the web on the evolving information ecosystem of publishing. And in that talk, I was making the point that we're moving toward a world of, of layered information architectures where we don't dump everything into the XML file. And, and that's a point I'll be coming back to again today. So, where were we in the 90s? If we, if we go back to when we started doing all of this interesting stuff, um, it was a different world. Um, I was digging through my files and I found a presentation I'd done in 99, and this was the definition of publishing that I'd used in 1999. Publishing is adding a useful degree of uniformity to information. Well, I still believe that's true but there's a lot more to it than just that um, today. But in the 90s, uh, you know, what were we doing? We were really focused on the version of record in SGML or XML full text, the perfect master file, you know, printing online and, and, and print, sorry, publishing online and in print, and a lot of publishers were using their XML as a, what I would call a pseudo database. And I've seen a lot of this. Um, you, in lieu of a content management system, you you'd dump the information into the XML itself. And some extreme examples, I saw one publisher that put the title history of the title in every single article um, and, and things like that, or their entire production process documented in attributes in the XML of the article, and so on. It was a very document-centric world. Um, there were some sophisticated examples. Um, the famous one is the Elsevier dataset.talk, where they pulled the issue-level metadata out of the articles and into a package, but that was for an issue world, an issue-centric world. But um, it was definitely a document world. And where are we today? And where are we going? So I s tried to revise that statement. I said, well, what are we doing today? Publishing is, is adding value to a content of collection, a collection of content by enrichment and by managing the information life cycle. And I think that's the biggest change, is that we're no longer in you know, publish and you're done. It just keeps on going. The world keeps changing, and you have to come back to the content. We are in a much more multi-dimensional, multi-system ecosystem. There's a lot going on. It's less static, less document-centric. It's actually, we're almost more database-like and more data-like than content-like, and the information models are more complicated now. And life cycle management is an essential piece of that. Um, 
I mean, in the end, uh, everything we do has to allow for future changes, add, change, and delete. The, the database verbs uh, apply to our content as well. So where does content management fit into this? I mean, this is the Wikipedia definition of content management. Normally, that phrase usually means the whole pro production editorial process, but, um, you know, but there are pieces of it that are relevant to what I'm talking about today in, in content enrichment, and that is version control and technical metadata and provenance metadata. The information about the, the, the content and how it was created so that you can manage it over time is very important. Uh, in the innovation seminar yesterday, we heard uh, Saeed speak about uh, data, um, data con conservancy and the digital preservation space has um, a lot to um, bring to what we're doing with content as well. Um, which was the topic of my 2004 talk for the e-production seminar, and that is coming back, and you'll see it in, in a little bit later in this. So to put this together, I thought about all the various initiatives and things that are going on in our industry and the kinds of things we're doing and um, enrichment activities, and what are the questions and architectural issues in implementing these. And I came up with a starter list of questions um, that to run through when you think about a project. And um, I'm going to follow this with some, some case studies and some specifics. But um, one of them was, um, you know, is this enrichment something we as publisher add at the end, or is it something that we interact with the author? Does it benefit from author interaction or vetting? Is this enrichment, whatever it is, is it part of the permanent scholarly record, or is it merely an annotation layer? Um, how standardized is the information? Um, does it use industry standard identifiers, nomenclature, whatever, or is it proprietary? And, and therefore, how volatile is it likely to be over time? And how volatile is it in general? Is it something that could change tomorrow because there's more information? So that, that's a frame of questions. Now I want to try them out against some of the, the projects that we've been doing in the industry in the past and, and going forward before I go to the AIP case study. So, if you think back to the 90s, I mean, the first really exciting content enrichment that we all did was reference linking. When we put our journals on the web and started linking the references, that's what led to Crossref and all kinds of things. And um, there was a number of different ways of doing that, and it was, was really interesting history there. Um, some publishers were, were doing it dynamically um, um, in their delivery system. Um, and as we got into it, um, some publishers moved it earlier in the process. Um, when I was at the University of Chicago Press, before Crossref existed, we were linking the American Journal of Human Genetics to, to PubMed Central. And we, we did it after publication for a while, and then we moved it back into the copy editing process and started querying the authors about why doesn't this, this citation link? And we discovered a 7% error rate that we were able to fix by moving reference linking back into the copy editing stage. That was a long time ago, but that was an early example in our industry of, of value add enrichment and you know the pros and cons of doing it after publication or during the publication process. And Bruce is going to tell us more about this theme in his presentation at the uh, end of today. The other interesting point when you think about uh, the history of reference linking that, that's relevant to us going forward is in the early days of Crossref, um, 
of course, publishers started with their current content and then their back file. And so when we first started using Crossref for reference linking, it wasn't comprehensive. So we knew that whatever we did in building links, we would have to come back to it again as more publishers deposited their content with DOIs and, and there was more links possible. So we knew from the very beginning that reference linking was something that we would have to revisit. Um, to improve it, and this is still going on. On the Crossref, um, as a, a board member in the usage stats of Crossref, we know there are publishers who are reprocessing all their references every month uh, to check for any recent DOIs that have been assigned to anything in their entire reference cor corpus. So there's a situation where that's, that information is volatile. And, and it, some, that publisher has architected a solution that based on the volatility of that information. So reference linking is, is uh, the poster child of, of our early and ongoing content enrichment in our industry and has led to all kinds of other interesting things. So the second example I have here is um, keywords and, and this is, um, an example of, of where in the process you put it. I mean, um, do you solicit from the author suggestions as to the keywords for an article? Lots of publishers do that. Or are you doing, um, a, and are those a standard vocabulary or are they just spontaneous, created by the author and so on? Um, and are they part of the permanent record? Are they published or are they just for management purposes? So another case of volatility. And I'll come back to this um, in talking about AIP's new semantic enrichment project. Affiliations, authors, and funding um, um, are, are things that are changing on us now. Um, obviously, ORCID is the new initiative in the author identity space. And Bruce, are you going to talk about ORCID as well? Yes, yeah, so Bruce will be touching on that. And, and funding information. But in all of these, the, one of the questions is where does the information come from and when and how is it going to change? And since we're having to connect to all these different systems, what's the information model between the systems? And there are cases where um, there's some mismatches between these systems. I'll come back to that. So to summarize then some key choices are when is the content enhanced? When in the process, by the author, sub, at the submission point, um, during production, or, or at the end in the hosting platform, perhaps. And, but then the fun question, for me at least, is and then where does that enhanced information live? Is it embedded in the content? Or is it external to the content? And that depends on the information model, what kind of content. And so that's what I'm going to dive into a little bit more. And then the related issues are, you know, what's the master source or copy of the information when there's multiple systems? And Bruce is going to talk about that one too, uh, and about peer review systems. And, um, is the information normalized or denormalized? I mean, historically, we have um, denormalized our metadata and put the entire title and, and issue information in every article, and that makes perfect sense. Um, but are there things that would be better suited to be truly normalized and, and kept outside the articles? Um, and how do you keep all these systems in order? So what it looks to me, looking at our industry over the last 20 years is, and where we're going and the initiatives and things that are happening now, is that we're moving to, from the document-centric to much more complex information models and architectures where what I would call you know, robust um, modeling becomes critical in, in building robust solutions. And there, there's some humorous examples, one in the industry right now, ORCID and FundRef. Crossref implemented ORCID and FundRef separately. So when you get the you, publisher can submit ORCID IDs for all the authors to associate with an article, and you can submit funding information for all the grants that funded the article, but at least right now in the Crossref data model, there's no way to say which grant went with which author. 
so there's something wrong with the data model there. And as it happens, the peer review system that we use, which is eJournal Press, actually collects the information on a per author basis. So we have more information than we can give to Crossref because the data models are out of sync. Now, that is likely to change long term, but I think that's an example of the world we're in now, where we're shoving information back and forth and around between all these systems, and the data model really matters. So, on checking that I'm okay on time, yeah. Um, so on to the project that we've been doing at AIP in the last two years. Um, we launched our, our new platform in October, and on that platform we also implemented a new physics thesaurus and author disambiguation and affiliation disambiguation. And in the course of that, there were some interesting architectural questions on how we made it work, and so I'm gonna walk you through some of those. I'm not saying that these are the perfect answers or these answers work for any question. These are the answers to our questions and how solutions in our particular uh, combination of systems and, and goals. So what we were trying to do, um, obviously we have 850,000 articles. We, um, going back 80 years, we were trying to uh, end up with a definitive um, subject page, author page, and institution page that would then point to the articles that um, had that subject, that, um, that that author had authored, or that that institution's uh, was say, cited as an affiliation for the authors in those articles. So that was the goal. Um, so the first really important decision we had to make was, um, you know, was this enrichment that we were going to do, was it going to be published in the, in the, the and part of the permanent record, or was it a, if in effect, a value add of the delivery platform? And that was the direction we ha uh, went down, that it's um, dynamic and um, volatile, and it is a property of the hosting um, platform, the delivery of the content, but is not part of the version of record. And this represented a change for us in one degree, because we had previously assigned PAX codes, that's the um, physics, um, that's the classification system that AIP developed many years ago. In the past, those were printed on the articles, and we are not doing that going forward. The semantic, um, the term assignments to the articles is done on the delivery platform and can change from day to day as the, the system improves. So that, that was a, a, a business change. From an architectural, um, so our partners for this, our publishing technology, their pub to web hosting platform and access innovation, so you'll hear from later in the program, for the semantic enrichment and the disambiguation. So, um, you know, a solution that integrates these two vendors and our own content management systems um, has to take into account how all the systems work. So, Publishing Technologies pub to web hosting platform is built on an RDF triple store, which is a cool technology and very useful for um, creating these kinds of relationships that this, this author page points to this article and so forth and so on. And um, it has um, great um, to support that but there's one thing in to create a relationship to say this institution page, the MIT, um, and this article here, and to do the link between them, the article has to be present in the system at the point where you declare the relationship. So that created a constraint on our, our, our workflow, which you'll see in a minute, that the articles have to be there before you describe the relationship between the articles and the abstract entities, an institution, an author, a, a, a topic. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just the nature of this system. It's not a, a bad thing, but it just says that every solution has to be tailored to the specifics of the systems you're interacting with and so on. So, um, 
to them. So the, here's uh, some of the choices we made in deciding the system. Um, we were using our suite for our content management and production framework in-house. Um, so it's our master repository. Um, and it does the version control for us and manages the interactions between these external systems, our enrichment vendor and our hosting vendors systems. And one of the key decisions was that we, we capture the processing history in our suite, not in the XML itself. Since we have the content management framework, we, we keep that history in the content management system, um, which is important because of the volatility, which we'll come back to. So, so then we had to decide what are we going to put in the XML and what are we going to not put in. And so the semantic enrichment, the new keywords, we decided to go ahead and put in the XML itself. And the reason for that um, was because it's not just a keyword group at the top of the article, it's also inline tagging throughout the whole article. So it really does have to be uh, in, in the XML. However, we manage the XML very carefully so that it is strippable. We can pull it all the enrichment out and then take the underlying article and reprocess it at any time. So that was important that it had to be reversible for us, the enrichment. But the disambiguation, the, the pointer from this author name or this affiliation name to the author page or the affiliation page, that we did not put in the article at all. That is an external annotation layer um, and is kept in separate files. And, and that's just a particular choice. There's, you know, you could do it the other way. And in, you know, if the circumstance were different, um, we might put it in the files. So when we start getting ORCID IDs from authors, we will put the ORCID IDs in the file because that's part of the permanent record, whereas the disambiguation is volatile information that's a value add but, but can change and works better externally, so on. So um, uh, the thesaurus, um, this is just a symbolic diagram. The subject pages are dynamically created um, from the articles because the articles, the, the, the keywords are in the articles by the hosting platform. But the author pages and the institution pages are actually an XML file that captures you know, this name um, and the list of all the articles that, that um, are believed to be by that person or from that institution. And those are actually XML files which are then passed through from Access Innovations to Publishing Technology and um, hosted on the platform. So um, here's the um, workflow diagram. Um, so um, we, the peer, obviously we start with the peer review system. Um, we are running the article abstracts off for semantic and, um, enrichment, but that's just for management purposes. Um, that's not part of the publication. We do it again once the article, we have the final version of the article. So the comes out at the end of the production process, having gone out to the vendor, production vendors and back. It then goes out to Access Innovations for semantic enrichment, and then they return um, the XML with the keywords and all the... Um, um, but at the same time, then they are updating the master files for the articles by John Smith or Joe Jones or, and the master file for articles by Harvard or MIT, from Harvard or MIT. And um, they um, send that back to us and then we pass it all on to pub to web platform. Um, but the, the amusing publishing detail is that we push each of the articles, we push the author and institution pages only once a day at the end of the day so that we know that all the articles for that day have already been processed and arrived. And as you know, the same author could have more than one article 
published in the same day. So we have to make sure that we keep the author and affiliation pages in sync. Um, so on, on the platform then, these are the disambiguation is, is a layer that points into the articles. So just for your amusement, here's some of the XML uh, for it. This is JATS. Um, the keyword group, um, you'll notice that the attribute on the keyword group type, um, the name we used, you know, SEM colon AIP thesaurus, that's, you know, an internal vocabulary to help us so that we can grab all of the markup associated with that across the, the manuscript. Um, and then the keyword um, name you'll see under content type for the keyword, it says AIP TH 1.2. So we are recording in the content the version of the thesaurus that was used, but not the version of the enrichment rules. That's captured as the date of enrichment in the content management system. And then the rest of the data is just the term, um, the numeric code in our thesaurus that corresponds to that term, and then the weighting. And then the example down at the bottom is the inline markup. Um, again, the same uh, 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 attributes to, so that we can strip it out and then links back to the top. So, you know, we have an XSLT that will pull all of that out and, and revert back to the, the unenriched file so that we can then reprocess it against the latest version of the enrichment rules. So, here's a little snippet of the um, author XML. This is, um, this is only part of the record, but um, it, this is just a separate file that we use the JATS vocabulary as much as possible. Um, the author ID here is an internal identifier within AIP. Um, and then it's just a list of, of pointers, the DOIs, back to the articles. And notice the contrib um, uh, sequence attribute. So what that's saying is this author in that article is the first author. And that's how the, the hosting platform builds the link. And so if you then went to that article and right-clicked over that author, the RDF triple store would, would know that that points back to this page and would then show you, can take you to the page with all the author's art, known articles. So, and the affiliation is very similar. Um, same idea, it's the DOI and then the affiliation sequence. So it's just pointing back into the XML um, in the same way. Um, so the, the last piece that I, I wanted to share was um, some of the, um, the use cases for the life cycle of this information that you know, we considered when we made our design choices. And, uh, there's no surprises here particularly. The point really is that you have to ask these questions in designing solutions. So um, what can change and when? And add, change, delete for everything. And what does that mean and how the system works and how, how, how the process is managed? So on our content, obviously, if an author does a significant correction, um, you know, that could mean that the author name was misspelled and now we have to reprocess the disambiguation or the affiliation or, you know, uh, potentially the, uh, less likely, but the keywords. But so we have to have a way to undo all of the enrichment and redo it at any point in time. So that was designed into the process from the beginning. On the thesaurus terms, obviously, the, the thesaurus will evolve over time. Science changes. There will be new terms. Um, we will refine the thesaurus. So we had to build into the plan the ability to reprocess everything. Um, and um, so that's why the thesaurus version numbers are, are captured, so that we can manage the um, update process gracefully. The enrichment rules, the 
Access Innovations engine that assigns the terms is a, a massive set of rules, um, but those rules can be tweaked every day. I mean, you know, at any point we could discover a way to improve a rule, and so we are assuming that at least in the first year that we will reprocess the entire corpus um, as the rule base improves. So again, that just means there has to be the ability to do it over again. So this data is volatile. Um, the author disambiguation is amusing. So. Um, you've got a, a, a paper um, where, you know, one article it says Evan Owens and another article it says E.P. Owens and you don't, but different affiliations and you don't immediately know they're the same author, but at some point later in the future you get some additional information and realize those are the same person and therefore, and then can point or if, you know, if you, um, have a system where, where the author tells you these are those, those are my articles and so on. So um, that was what led us to want to say that this was all external, the disambiguation. So, and same with the institutional, but then there's an extra problem there. We know the world can change. Institutions can change their name, they can merge, and so how you manage all of that, you just have to assume there's going to be change. So, so really the bottom line here in all of this is that um, we're in a world where it's just not publish a document and you're done. The documents are, our documents live in a complex ecosystem, connect to lots of other things. The world is changing and it will continue to change. So that just says we have to model our information architecture really well. And, um, I think of this as multi-dimensional. There's the horizontal dimension that Bruce is going to talk about. You know, when in the process do you add the, you know, the, the value? And there's the vertical. Does it live in the content or on top or above the content? But the bottom line is we are in a world of add, change, and delete. And the world <laughs> is going to change. And so that requires robust data modeling so that we can have robust solutions and keep going, doing cool things to add value to our content. Questions? Other questions to add to my list of questions? <laughs> yes. <coughs> okay, yeah. can you um, give your name and affiliation if you wouldn't mind? You, you can go first if you like. Oh, you want to have a, oh here she comes, yes. Good. Uh, John Day, RCM Publishing. Uh, can you give us some sort of idea of the the costs involved in uh, adding this type of enrichment and how you measure return on investment? No. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to the vendors. They're all here. I'm sure they'll all be happy to quote you. <laughs> but that, that's their business. OK, that's a very definite answer. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, any uh, further questions? Um, yeah. Yes? You, uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Hindawi himself, in person. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Ahmed Hindel from Hindel Publishing. I just, I wonder if you have used the word volatile in this presentation to actually mean two things um, uh, uh, that are probably should be differentiated, which is something that can change for a legitimate reason. You change your classific back classification system or an institute or, or, you know, something that, that changes. And the other, the other way you used it is to, re to, to refer to the information that are either you don't feel comfortable enough because they're not accurate enough or they might be incorrect. And I think we should, you know, my mind kept going back and forth, you know, what, what do you mean by vol volatile? Is it inaccuracy that you, you perceive there is a particular level of inaccuracy in the information and not comfortable putting it in the document or doing this with it? Or is it because it's an information that it's, it's perfectly accurate, but it can change over time? Yeah, um, those, those are both interesting points, and they're just two different kinds of volatility. Um, it, then that has to do with the question of how standardized is the information. I mean, uh, you think about a DOI. The whole point of a DOI is to, is to um, protect us from the volatility of the URL. So the DOI, 
is standard and less volatile. And even ORCID knows that there and have f implemented the ability to make two ORCIDs point into one when there was a mistake. So that protects us because of the, the, the level of indirection there. So that information is less volatile. But yeah, but I mean, quality, I mean, we're all human beings. Authors make mistakes. I mean, things change. So, um, but then there's also um, reality changes. You know, if the name of an institution changes over time, then you have to manage the fact that it's the same institution, but it was called this for this decade, and then its name changed. And so that's a kind of planned or normal volatility. <coughs> One, one other thing I, I, I would like to offer is a, is a little sort of a ber little bit of personal experience, which I found it very odd when it happened, but we, we acted on it because we, we were, a number of years ago, we were asking authors to classify the mathematics papers published with us according to the AMS mathematics subject classification scheme, which is a very mature scheme yeah, that's used both by the American Mathematical Society and by the uh, Zentabat for Mathematics in, uh, in Germany. And they were giving us the classification codes for their papers. So this paper is whatever you know it is. And we were publishing that with the paper. After a couple of years, we discovered that when the mathematical review editors and, and reviewers classify our papers in order to include them in their database, the classifications are different. And they're not, not in 1% of the cases, in many of the cases. And we felt, after looking at this very carefully, that they actually are more accurate than the, than the authors of the papers published with us. And we decided to take them off because we thought it, 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 we shouldn't be including information that is not accurate enough, even if they have been provided by the author. Let alone keywords, that was a controlled vocabulary classification system for mathematics. I don't know what this is, you know, maybe tell you or tell anybody, but it's just, it's, don't trust the authors that much, maybe be very careful about what you include in the version of record of your, uh, of your article, maybe. Um, Bruce would like to make a comment on that. Bruce Rosenblum. And sure, Bruce I've... Rosenblum from Monero. I'll, I'll respond to that and, uh, okay. with sort of a three-tier hierarchy of metadata quality. Uh, and the simple summary is, the fewer people you have assigning metadata to an item or to a corpus of items, the higher the quality because the more consistency. The more people you have, the lower the quality. And the best example I can give as a direct comparison is the metadata at PubMed is consistently far higher quality because it's set up by librarians and it's a very small group of librarians with very clear rules. Compare that with the metadata you get back from Crossref for the same articles, it's much lower quality, it's much more inconsistent because it's all deposited by individual publishers and individual publishers have different uh, ways of setting up metadata and different quality standards for curating and depositing that metadata. So then you expand it out to, instead of a single organization or a broad group of publishers, you expand that to the authors, every author is going to have their own idea of how to apply metadata. That's why a lot of organizations take author keywords and immediately throw them out the door. And PubMed, for example, with mesh keywords says, we don't care what the publishers assign, we're going to assign them based on reading the abstract. So the broader the number of people assigning metadata, the lower the quality it will be. Have you any comments on that, Evan? Yeah, no, um, that's actually good. I would say that, you know, back to my slide with questions you should ask, was we have a new one, uh, what is the quality of yeah. the external information? I, I assumed it would be the publisher generated or publisher service provider generated. You, have, you absolutely have to be aware of the quality. But when you start going outside, completely outside, then there's another set of quality issues. Yeah, so that's a, yet another component of designing a solution. The, the, the whole question, I'm going to come back to you, Bill. Just, the question of the volatility of the version of record is, is really very new in perception of managerial levels of publishing, as you know. I mean, only a few years ago, if any people were involved in the NISO activities, we were talking about the permanent record. And now we're talking about stewardship of the ongoing version of record, correct? Yeah. Somebody was wanting to speak. Where are we? Oh, it's, it's not only, it's Mr. Kasdorf himself. Yeah. Yes? Bill Kasdorf. Um, Evan, I wonder if you've um, got any comments on 
the uh, interchange of your content with its semantics and its um, nomenclature, et cetera, with external parties that you need to deal with. We to don't uh, share that information. Okay, so this is purely a closed system yeah. within the, AIP. The enrichment is entirely within our, so all of our external data partners don't get our proprietary. Do you have to give them uh, do you have to give them information that's in their uh, schemes that corresponds to what's in your scheme? We don't. We don't. Okay. That doesn't apply. Again, because it's volatile. Uh, uh, other questions? Any other questions for Bill? Yes, there's one here. James. James Walker, IOP. Um, Evan, when making those changes, is, do you use a mechanism of signaling that you've made a change, uh, that perhaps to an article, out to the, uh, the, the, the users of the site? Do you use things like Crossmark or anything like that, or some other mechanism? Oh, absolutely. We're Crossmark. I mean, it depends on, on what it is, but, but the, the things that are like, kind of considered to be an annotation layer of a, a, a function of the hosting platform are, are not a, a crossmark kind of change. If we're changing the text of the article, the version of record, that is a crossmark change. And definitely, yes, we do use crossmark for any version of record change. But, so. Any other questions? Yes, just a second. The machine is coming. I must say, incidentally, Evan, your presentation was absolutely wonderful, and that's why I put you first, because I knew it would be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Paul Collin, Q Science. I'm just interested, um, what do your end users make of this? Do they value all of the work, the effort that you put into I'm, this? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, what do the end users make of it? Uh, do they value your work? Um, this platform is only six weeks old. <laughs> you, you didn't say that at the beginning. So, uh, so we're approaching two months now. The initial feedback of the semantic and the new topic pages and the semantic enrichment has been very positive. Um, it's been very well received. Um, you know, in, in any system of this size and complexity, there will be tweaks. Uh, we, we had one, we spotted one error in one term that was being assigned incorrectly, and that, that's normal, and, and maintenance, and fixed it, and uh, corrected the articles, and so on. But the um, semantic enrichment has is, is, uh, gone over very well, the, the new part. The um, affiliation and, and uh, author disambiguation um, is a navigation tool. We think about it as a way of, of navigating the content collection. and. Um, We'll be interested to mo monitor the metrics of, of user behavior and, and, and what value it adds. But it's brand new, so. Uh, one time for one short question. Yeah. Any short questions? No. <laughs> okay, well, I think we should thank, I really am grateful. Thank you.